I'm going to talk to you more about what's going on in our entomology collection. I'm glad we get to go back to back and kind of present you with all the great research we're doing. So it's a really good opportunity for us to talk about it because we are a very research intensive part of the museum and we always have a lot of things going on. Um, and my project is, is separate and parallel to Claudia's, so it kind of shows you how we're covering a lot of different questions with our very large collection. So mine's the Islands of Biodiversity Project, which I initiated when I first started here and has kind of been developing over time. And there's a number of questions in it that are all kind of born of questions that we've had sitting around in the collection, questions that we have from the public when we have events. And these are good questions like, well, are oil tankers going to affect insects on the coast? I'm sure that's not the first thing people ask. They usually ask about, you know, larger charismatic things like whales and vertebrates and things like that. But I'm sure what they're getting at is, how is it going to affect insects on the coast? And that's a very good question. They ask things about um, climate change. Is climate change changing water temperatures? And do El Nino events affect what things you find on the coast? That's a really good question, uh, which we might have or they might have. Questions like, well, what about development along the coast? Well, oceanfront property is very great, and building a dock is great, but how is that affecting what species you find on the coast? That's a really good question. But it all starts with a question that we have a hard time answering, which is, well, what species are already there? What, what insect and spiders are on the coast across BC? And that actually is not a trivial question. As you saw with Claudia, you know, you're talking about a 1,000 species of spiders, a lot of them at high altitude that they're finding. A similar thing could be found on the coast. You know, 35,000 species of insects and spiders in BC. Um, how many of them are on the coast? How many of them haven't been described? How many of them we don't really know their distribution is a lot of them. So all of these bigger questions we get to, and I'm going to keep coming back to them, start with this, well, we don't really know what's on the coast to start with. So that was the starting point for this project, is what insects and spiders do we have on the coast at all? So. It's great because it allows me to collect on beaches. I mean, I came from Ontario and I didn't know about oceans or tides or anything like that. So it's a great opportunity for me to come to walk around on nice beaches and look across at Gulf Islands and, and do some great collecting. But all of these places lead to some interesting questions. I mean, even just this morning, we were kind of sitting there waiting for it to begin and we had questions like, well, what is a coastline habitat? What is an intertidal zone? And you're like, well, no, it's a great place to have a picnic. You know, here's Island View Beach. It's wonderful. You sit there and you try to avoid getting run over by a dog and you enjoy your lunch. Uh, but what is the intertidal zone? Well, it's the part that's not under the water sometimes. And it's near the water, but it's not in the forest. And it's not in salt water because insects and spiders can't live in salt water. So that's kind of a hard line, but it's a hard line that moves. And you have salty sand and you have seaweed that washes up and you have driftwood in all of these areas but it's also not consistent as i sit here and look out from galliano island you look and say wow there's a lot of potentially great beaches around here and each of those could have unique different species on them except you go around the corner and it's all rocky and there's no beach there or the tides are really strange there and it's not a beach so it's a very inconsistent and hard to map habitat so to, to work on coastlines in bc means having to figure out what you even mean by coastlines and how does that affect it. And insects and spiders have figured it out, even if I haven't. Then multiply it by a huge number, which is 25,000 kilometers, which is roughly the amount of coastline in BC if you include all the little islands. That's more than the UK. That's more than India. This is a huge amount of coastline that could be covered in a huge north-south uh, range. There's actually a really big east-west range that you don't realize. There's a huge range that's being covered even if I just say, oh, I just work on beaches. That's a huge amount of area and a lot of different habitats that might potentially be covered. Now, that being said, this might seem insurmountable, but, you know, every step starts with something. So this is an example of the last year. Field work I've been able to do through a number of different projects and collaborations, and I'll talk about those if I get a chance, um, throughout the province. So. Some of these places, as you can see, are very close. These are great little day trips that I can go out from here or go out with my kids or go on field trip or events with the museum that are all relatively close, you know, from up to Nanaimo, Ladysmith Harbor, down through, through here, the Gulf Islands. Um, one trip over to Pacific Rim National Park, which was great. It was a great opportunity to get out there for a bio blitz. And then a number of sites you see up here, which were all part of the Canada C3 trip, which was a unique opportunity, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. I talked about it at a, 
at an all staff event and at a live at lunch. But the key for this talk is that it, it gave me the chance to collect at a number of coastline places in the northern part of the province that I wouldn't have gotten to, including a number of places in Haida Gwaii and in Guayanas National Park Reserve, which I really wouldn't have had a chance without a boat and with people that live there and able to show me to these wonderful places, and places like Hartley Bay. So this is just the past year, which is great, and I hope in future years they will fill in and it'll look like a great map like Claudia had of nice yellow dots, which for eternity will always have those annoying gaps in them. But it also brings in great questions that ties back into things like Erica was talking about is, you know, do we have lines here? Do we have biogeographic breaks? The conventional knowledge about BC in the coastline, if you look at, say, an eco-province approach, which says if you take the habitat and the, the vegetation of the province, you can break it up into rough areas that sort of describe it. Well, when it comes to the coastline, the conventional knowledge is there's only two coastlines in BC. There's the Georgia Depression, which is kind of what we would call the Salish Sea, the Gulf Islands, Victoria, just barely including the Vancouver um, shoreline, maybe up as far as Campbell River. That's one, and everything else counts as coast and mountains. Maybe that is true. Maybe that really is the only way. Is there a meaningful difference in the insect species in those two that mean something? Are there more fine, fine scaled ways to divide up the province? I mean, how is Haida Gwaii not have a really different fauna than the rest of the province? It seems so different. And with insects, shouldn't it have a really different fauna? And we don't know yet. Um, it is encouraging to think that we might start to see this. For example, and I'll skip to the next slide just to be able to show you what I'm talking about. Here, and I, I did wait till the second slide to show the insect pictures. Not as scary as spiders as some, but I think they're pretty. I should have started sooner. Here you have a long-legged fly. They're nice little predators. They're in a lot of different habitats, but there's some that are specialized to be on shorelines. They're hunting small insects on beaches or near beaches. And we just had a collaborator, and this kind of is my chance to plug in the collaboration we did, come in from the Canadian National Collection, spent a week here, was looking through our collections of long-legged flies and a few other families, and talking with him over coffee and lunch, saying, you know, they found a bunch of these in California, and what they were starting to see is every bay and beach had different species. And they all thought, oh, there's only a couple of them, and they started to see it. And so then the logical question for me is, well, is there a similar pattern in BC? And we have so many different islands and beaches and regions. Shouldn't we have a bunch of species of these? He said, well, that's great. We, we got to start working on that. So this is the sort of thing that leads to it, a group that's relatively well known, relatively large number, but is likely to turn up interesting patterns. And then you get other groups like this, which I may not be as pretty to you. I like these a lot. These are Fusilia flies which is interesting because this is a case where beaches give you a different take on it because these are common root maggots. They're in agricultural pests and they're fine, except there's one small group of them that are only on seaweed. So I've started to find these on beaches and what I'm finding is even beaches here in town, you're finding three or four species living together. Why do you get them all on the same seaweed? Are they subdividing this seaweed in some way that we don't realize? Great question for us to ask amongst what is kind of looks like a normal little house fly. But trust me, when you look under the microscope, they're beautiful and great. Um, this is an example, like the pie chart of the data that we're getting. These are specimens in the last year. As you see, there's a big bias towards flies. That's because of the way I collect. I collect by sweeping and setting up nets that catch flying things. One of the things I have to consciously work on is to collect more crawling things with pitfall traps or with digging things underneath, beating things to get more spiders. I don't get as many spiders as Claudia because I collect in a different way. So. I've got to work on that, but I'm happy to have lots of flies because I like flies. And the outputs from this, like what is this going to lead to? Besides getting a great chance to talk um, at events like this, and like I said, live at lunch or doing articles for What's Insight, there was a pocket gallery, which was great. I got to work with Shane to produce some great pictures and the exhibits team to put together this great way to show insects and great little natural history stories about weird and neat things on a beach, which was a really successful pocket gallery, and it really grabbed the public, and I was able to talk to the radio and newspaper about it, and they liked it. Chances to go out into the field and collect, this was on the C3 trip, to be able to do what I do and tell people about it, and then to be able to come back to the museum, look at the things we collect in the field, look historically in the collection, and this is the one thing I've discovered is a hundred years of people that have collected on beaches and they're in our collection waiting to be looked at 
from Savory Island in 1918 to the Brooks Peninsula exhibition, expedition, and other things in between is all a great opportunity for me to do research. Thank you.